So welcome to Coco Conversations. This is the sixth online conversation we organize to highlight and draw attention to fascinating and cutting edge research published with the Journal of Cooperation and Conflict. Today, we are to discuss the newly published article, A Transcalar Approach to Peacebuilding and Transitional Justice, Insights from the Democratic Republic of Congo, authored by Sarah Hellmuller, who is joining me today from the Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies in Geneva, where she is a senior researcher and leads a project on the impact of shifting world politics on peace building. And also to mention, she is the author of the book Partners for Peace, which analyzes local international interactions, also with a focus on Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo. So welcome, Sarah. Thank you very much. And as commentators, uh, we and to give their views and discuss the article with Sarah, we have invited Gerard Miller, who is senior researcher, uh, senior lecturer and head of sociology at the University of Aberdeen. And in his current research, he's developing ideas about how to construct complex transscalar peace systems. And we've also invited Susan Buckley Sistel, who is Professor of Peace and Conflict Studies at Phillips University Marburg. And her research has advanced the spatial turn in peace and conflict studies. And she has extensive expertise on transitional justice. So welcome to you too. I'm happy to have you on board for this COCO conversation. And my name is Annika Björkdahl and I'm Professor of Political Science at Lund University. And I have for the last 10 years been the editor of Cooperation and Conflict. And my task today is quite simple. I'm just to moderate this, what I think will be a very constructive and interesting conversation. So perhaps to get us started, um, I will ask a few uh, questions initially. So Sarah, this is what we think a very important article uh, on transcalar approaches to peace building and transitional justice. And we think it makes several contributions also to the spatial turn in peace and conflict studies. Um, and the way we see it is that, you know, first of all, the concept of transcalarity is fascinating and is an important contribution. And also the how you apply it to transitional justice. And of course, it also provides interesting and important insights to transitional justice in the DRC. And my first question to you, Sarah, would be, what are your own personal intellectual trajectory that leads you to write this article? And what would you say are the main contributions of the article? Thank you very much, uh, Annika, for this introduction. And thank you all for, for being here. So, about the intellectual trajectory that led me to write uh, this article. It was actually during my very first stay in the Democratic Republic of Congo, and more specifically in the province of Ituri in the northeast of the country, that I observed something that was basically fundamentally puzzling uh, to me, which was that the diverse peace building actors I met, and here I'm talking about both local or what we would generally call local peace builders, so those with their headquarters in um, the country itself and mostly Congolese staff, as well as those we would usually call international peace builders. So those with their headquarters outside of the country and also some expatriate uh, staff, that all these peace building actors across different scales, they basically agreed that each set of actors had specific comparative advantages and that local and international peace building projects and programs were actually complementary. But at the same time, uh, and this was uh, sort of puzzling to me, um, they all complained about a lack of cooperation and also had negative rather than positive perceptions of each other. And I also observed that they uh, virtually all these actors, they actually invested a lot both professionally and privately in making and building peace. So I wondered then what was actually or what were the obstacles to more cooperation and then eventually, of course, also more sustainable peace. And in the framework of the local turn in, in peace research, there had, of course, been a lot of um, emphasis on local actors, as well as a little bit later on the interaction between local and international actors with concepts such as hybridity and friction. 
But I found it quite puzzling also that while on the international side, usually we focus on peace building actors, on the local side, the focus is very much on the broader population or the general population, rather than also on, on, on peace building actors. So I really wanted to focus basically on peace building actors or peace builders on both the local and the international um, side. And the concept of transscalarity introduced by Gerard, in my view, best describes what I actually observed in Eastern Congo, namely that what is needed to overcome these obstacles to more cooperation is or are actually what I would call the two main pillars of this transcalar approach. First, a consistency of purpose, and second, a parity of esteem for actors across scales. So in the article, I analyze basically um, the transcalar approach in the peace process in Ituri. And I argue that it, um, a transcalar approach was, was fundamentally needed because the conflict issue them, issues themselves were transcalar, meaning that I argue we cannot really talk about local or national or regional conflict issues, but each conflict issue is, is actually influenced by different spheres at the same time. So given that conflict issues are transcalar, also the response to the conflict um, should be transcalar. And I basically show that um, uh, in the article by um, analyzing the peace process in Ituri. And when it comes to the, the main contributions of the articles, I think that apart from smaller contributions the article makes, uh, for instance, by providing more empirical insights about the transitional, transi uh, transitional justice process um, in uh, Congo, which has been a relatively understudied um, context in the transitional justice literature, and also somehow linking transitional justice and peace building literature. I think uh, the main contribution is really that it adds more empirical insights on transcalarity and it further develops the, the, um, the concept theoretical foundations. And I think three points are important in that regard. First, I think transcalarity has mostly been applied to kind of systems of a positive peace. And I extended the scope of application also to see how it can come about to bring about a negative peace. Second, I further disaggregate positive peace into different components by then mostly focusing on transitional justice. And third, I unpack further when such a transcalar approach actually comes about unintentionally and when it needs kind of purposeful uh, intention. And this then helps to uncover um, the enabling conditions for transcalarity as well as how we could potentially promote it. So the article in the end, in the end actually shows, I think, quite a high potential of, of transcalarity um, and argues that by me, by basically mainstreaming such an approach in peace research and applying it to different kind of subfields of, um, of peace research, we could actually make for better coordinated and also more purposeful um, peace building efforts across um, different scales. And this, to some extent, li then links to the, to the spatial and the local turn in peace research as, as it really takes the, the, the peace process as unit of analysis and basically analyzes interactions of different actors um, in these spaces rather than assigning the spaces in a fixed manner to the actors. So in other words, I think um, the article really focuses on relations rather than actors, um, also to avoid a basic uh, dichotomies or essentializing. Um, so I, I think one of the main contributions in that regard is that I provide really a situated understanding of the local and the international as an emplaced constellation of scalar relations. Thank you very much for, for sharing this with us, Sarah. And, and I totally agree. I am fascinated by this relational approach that you take uh, on, on peace, basically. Uh, but I'm sure that our distinguished uh, commentators want to share their reflections. So, Susanna, I invite you to, to go first, please. Yes, thank you. Thanks for inviting me. And um, I think this is a great format. And I'm very much appreciating the opportunity to actually having the, uh, to be able to talk to you, Sarah, about your article that we probably wouldn't have had otherwise unless we met at a conference. 
or similar, but you know, that's also a very, very nice substitute for it. Um, I have two questions. One is maybe a little bit easier to answer and the other one is probably a little bit more complex. So the first one is on your, I really like reading the article, I have to maybe say this first, um, it kind of brings together a lot of my interests. So I'm very, I was very curious, you know, I'm interested in Central Africa, I'm interested in transitional justice, I'm interested in spatial issues, um, and I've learned a lot um, empirically, but also kind of in terms of applying concepts and, and, and networks. And I wasn't, I'm sorry, Jared, I wasn't familiar with the transcalar approach yet. So um, that was also, I find this really enlightening. Um, first question would be on transitional justice. I have the feeling that your understanding of transitional justice is rather a positive understanding. I think it's on page 10 or 11 where you write that um, uh, on the local level, people in Etoria were disappointed that there was no truth seeking. That kind of assumes, and I think not just from them, but also from the author, that's you, that truth seeking in and of itself is actually um, a positive, constructive, uh, peace building, positive peace approaching, enabling, uh, making possible strategy. But there is a lot of evidence that truth seeking and kind of uncovering the truth actually leads to conflict. Sometimes South Africa would be the old example, uh, possibly even to more conflict, because all of a sudden everybody knows what the other person has done, and then you have to negotiate in the community even or in particular on the local level, Gachata and Rwanda would be another example, where all of a sudden with all the dirt that has come up by through truth seeking, um, the community is kind of challenged on a different level again. And kind of related to this, because I only have two questions, so this is part of the first question. Um, I understand that people on the local level um, have communicated that they were interested in truth seeking, but do we then not have a level, a problem of somebody speaking, but others not hearing? And I think you answer that to some extent when you refer to kind of more political interests by also um, donors, international donors, that they were more interested in, uh, in politics and uh, elections, and then the whole idea was dropped after the elections. And maybe um, I'd like to encourage you to say a little bit more about the politics of transition and justice, because I think that's a very good example. How opportunities open, windows open, and then they close if the political will is not there. So that was the easy question. Uh, the little bit more complex question uh, is on the notion of scale. I actually read, uh, after having read your piece, I went to Jared Miller's piece and read it. And I'm sorry, Jared, I hadn't read it before, but it only came out last year. So I only would have had one, one year to actually read it. Um, Sarah, when I wrote yours, I wrote on the on the margin of the of the of the article. I wrote uh, that sounds like Lederer's pyramid, and then I went back to Jared and realized that this transcalar approach is actually based on Lederer. So I thought, well, that hunch was um, get it, kind of right. But the issue I have with Lederach and that and maybe also with Jared and you, Sarah, is that you treat scales as if they were hermetically sealed. You treat them like containers um, that are permanent, that are kind of fixed in time and space. Um, you, the whole idea of transcalarity would be from a spatial turn perspective called scale jumping. So you jump from one scale to another, um, assuming that they're actually there they can actually resist your jumping. So you just jump on them and they don't give in. And from a um, spatial term perspective, the focus would be more on how these different scales are actually created in um, agency, in activities, um, and how fluid they are and how interconnected they are. And in particular, I think with um, your work, the fluidity and the um, it's, it's kind of um, easy to trace back, but maybe also the kind of the mutual constitution, because when you talk about, and it's the two of you, uh, talk about kind of experts at various levels, uh, we can wonder, are they actually always at one particular level, or is it not, when who are experts? I mean, how do they, they might come from a local level and then be on a mid-leaders level, to use leader's term, or on a national or international global level. Um, but come from somewhere locally where they gained their expertise, 
similarly how is knowledge constructed that comes from somewhere as well you know it's never international it's never global it's always situated somewhere so um i think the question is or the comment is and I think it's necessary to break open these container categories of various scales to make them more fluid and to see and um, how they're mutually constitutive and constituted, and then to gain some insights um, about how that actually has an effect on this strength scalar approach, which really says, I don't want to work, use the word holistic, but you know, all scales have to be included and ideally bottom up. Um, yeah. So that's maybe more common than um, a question. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Susanne. Intriguing questions uh, and, and great insights. So Sarah, how do we respond to these comments? <laughs> Thank you very much, first of all, uh, Susanne, for these uh, great questions. Um, so I fully understand that um, um, your, your first question with regards to you know, this, this underlining possibly positive assumption about the consequences of truth seeking. And I didn't have, you know, also enough space to maybe develop a slightly more critical approach to the entire, I think, transitional justice um, uh, literature in the article. But I think um, I can confirm that there was a, a highly positive understanding of many of my interviewees um, about truth telling, truth seeking also based on the experience they have made locally, because there were, um, as I write in the article, there, were, there was some truth telling basically enabled through local peace builders where they brought previously antagonistic communities together and they started slowly but surely, you know, this process of um, one person starts telling how they experienced the war, et cetera. And this actually was experienced as quite a positive experience. And, but they always said that this was okay for, for, or this was basically enough for small scale violence, but many also said, but what about the big massacres? We need more, we need institutionalized processes also to know what exactly happened there. And um, so I think there was this, um, this rather positive understanding um, of, of, um, of truth seeking. And maybe that would have been basically changed as if now the, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission really had a truth seeking um, mechanism. We don't know um, this. But what I mainly try to show um, um, by this is not so much potential consequences of what different local and international actors had as, as priorities, but really what their, what their main purposes uh, was. Uh, were so, um, uh, and I try to show that for local actors, the purpose is really to re-establish relationships, to re-establish social cohesion, because that was what affected their daily lives most. The fact that, for instance, they could not go to the same markets anymore during the conflict because it was heavily ethnicized. Um, the fact that they could not travel freely um, in the province, etc. So this re-establishment of relationships um, was actually a priority. While, as I show on the international um, side, the elections in the transitional period was, was really the priority. And this led to basically this inconsistency of purpose and therefore also a non-alignment of their, their programs um, and, and, and projects. And um, yes, with regard to politics of transitional justice, um, I have a lot of interview material also on this, how the, um, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was politicized, how it was used by different actors, again, for different purposes. But the bottom line, basically, that I show in the article is really that you know, the purposes differed and therefore also the mechanism basically um, uh, failed to bring sustainable peace. And then with regard to your second um, question about um, this concept of, of scale, um, I think what is important to, to, to see here, I, I, I try to really um, convey that I don't see them as um, hermetically sealed. And instead of using, for instance, the, the terms levels, um, uh, you know, I, I try to use scales to show that they are also, um, um, first of all, connected. And then second, and there, I, I think I differ a little bit, or I wanted to go beyond basically also Lederach's pyramid. I don't see them as kind of in a hierarchical order. I see them more as basically, you know, in a, in a horizontal than in a vert vertical um, order in terms of, 
I wouldn't necessarily say that, I don't know, the global is here and the local is, is here, but they are really kind of just different scales at what um, at, uh, where things happen. And I think the, the, then also the, um, the kind of the term trans scale really shows that what what the folk where the sh focus should be is actually on the dynamic interaction between these scales rather than basically on each different scale. And I try to show that both with regards to the conflict issues, as I explained before, so that we don't assign um, uh, specific conflict issues to one scale, but we really look at how they kind of manifest in a trans scalar manner. And the same also for um, for the actors or the, the, the peace building actors and their relations, how do they basically um, uh, manifest at, at, at different scales. And I fully agree that, you know, um, I mean, maybe this is a first step, but we, we could even go further, we could break them up even further. And um, uh, I think that's also maybe a difference from my approach to then the spatial turn approach. I didn't necessarily look at how these categories were created in the first place, and um, the local and international, although I critically discussed that in, in other instances. And I try also, what I try to do is um, to add a critical element when I identified the, the, the actors in the first place. So for instance, to identify uh, local peace builders, I did not just have a list of basically criteria and then looked at who matches these criteria, but I really, through different conversations while being in Ituri, I looked at who self-identified or who was identified by others as local peace builder. And therefore I tried to kind of have a contextualized understanding of what local means rather than one um, that that just kind of differentiates, you know, everything or that calls everything local that is not international and, and vice versa. Um, so those are just some some reflections to react to to your very helpful comments. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Sarah, for great responses uh, and the whole notion of scale and what's between the scales is uh, is quite fascinating. And what does scale and transscalar and transcalarity actually tell us about reality? I think there is a, a lot to be investigated here. And, and I think Gerard has uh, some insights to this. So I leave the floor to you, Gerard, uh, please. Well, I, I appreciate Sarah's um, responses uh, to those questions. I, I would, I would uh, echo uh, most of those responses, really. That, the, the entire move to Scalar was in response to critique from previous work where people, including myself, used the term level. And we were told it's really hermetically sealing off these levels. Scalar is the approach you should be taking. And so that was exactly why that turn happened, was to introduce precisely this. But I would say, I mean, this is a conceptual and um, ambitious kind of crafting of a model, which uh is in its very early stages and requires a lot more thinking and in this first presentation it certainly was presented in a way that is probably uh overly simplistic in an attempt to um at least outline the broad brush strokes of what it is and then it's for exactly people like sarah obviously my future publications etc other people to develop it into something that can be more uh, useful, but also conceptually kind of coherent and, and fleshed out, and and so I think that uh, that this this article is a good one, as far as I know, uh, the first kind of attempt to follow on from that 2021 article and 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 kind of take it uh, a bit further and put some empirical bones on it. And so I really appreciated the the article, um, Sarah, and um, and and I really think that it does kind of show how this can be the concepts can be used or applied. Um, in different ways to different things, right? So, so it's clear to me that you know questions emerge regarding the broad model as a result of 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 your article. But at the same time, it does kind of indicate, as you pointed out yourself, the the value of some of these concepts that are that are in the model. Um, but so I had a couple of questions too, but mine are less about the model and more about kind of what what you found says about the model or what it might say about the applicability of the model, not for really analyzing peace building or transitional justice or peacemaking processes, but what it says maybe about whether or not it's applicable to the real world or whether it could inform policy, right? So, so one thing that I noted was that 
the case that seems to have worked or that appears to have had, uh, you know, had dynamics of transscalar coherence uh, really is peacemaking, right? It's, it's, it's kind of the attempts at various scales by different actors at each of these scales were kind of parallel to each other working towards ending the violence. Um, and so this seems to have therefore uh, had some of the characteristics of what we would call transscalar coherence almost unintentionally but obviously ending violence this peacemaking phase is, is often a priority for many actors kind of all at once whereas when you transition to a post conf post post um yeah post conflict the peace building phase after we have achieved a negative peace peace building transitional justice development come in as uh, some people's priorities, but often not everyone's priorities, or the or, or or different actors at different scales, and even different actors at the same scale, will have very different kind of conceptions of something like justice, or a positive peace, or what development means and how it should be achieved. So while so I'm wondering, is there is there an issue here with priorities, right? So so peacemaking, ending the violence, achieving that negative peace was clearly a priority for lots of people, lots of actors at the at the scales and across the scales um, and between the scales. Whereas perhaps we have a problem if we're talking about things like transitional justice that will be much harder, maybe even impossible, to get transscalar coherence around, around concepts of justice and how it should be applied, whether reconciliation is a good thing, whether truth is a good thing, etc. So is this something that we'll have to, is there an answer to this really? Um, or is it just that, that uh, kind of Peacemaking will always be something that everyone can get around, and peace building maybe won't be, uh, or at least not in the same way uh, that we could achieve that coherence. And then the second question I has I had was, you know, um, I appreciate that you appreciated this kind of concern. You know, really, I kind of at the end of that original article come back to this, or maybe that's really the intent of the article is to get to the notion that we need to have more coherence, right? Um, uh, as you pointed out when you're reflecting on your own, the intellectual kind of origin of these ideas, you know, overcoming this coordination problem is a long-term issue within peace building, humanitarian response, you know, development. Um, and I, I completely agree with that. And so I'm wondering, and so I appreciate that you kind of noted the, you know, the consistency of purpose as being an important element here. And this is what brought in Lederach's model, because obviously this is you know, the way he kind of framed it. And that's what I then built kind of this model on. Um, but I'm wondering, can, can, can an intentional convergence, is it possible in essence to manufacture this or force this or uh, inspire this or uh, incentivize this, right? So part of the model is based on, on, on really an overly potentially overly ambitious assumption that that kind of intentional convergence around a purpose can somehow then switch kind of organically to being a more habitual coherence of purpose. Um, and when I even when I was writing it, you know, I had to defend it in the article as being, you know, this is probably overly ambitious, but we need to have ambition. Um, and so I guess that's the open question. Um, is that is that going to be possible? And particularly in reflection of this, this priority issue with things like transitional justice, where there will always be debates and discussion and con conflict about what that means and how it should be achieved. Will it ever be really possible to one manufacture convergence and then for have that to have that somehow switch over time to more of a habitual a kind of coherence of purpose? Thank you. Thank you very much, Gerard. Sarah, back to you. Thank you very much um, for these uh, intriguing questions and reflections. I so with regards to your first uh, comment, I think yes. Of course, I think it is easier to build around or to build consistency of purpose or to have consistency of purpose around ending violence. And um, also, I think we have seen that in many places that this is usually, of course, the immediate uh, and kind of the priority of uh, peacemaking, peace building actors. We have in other research, we have also looked at norms in mediation, for instance, and there we saw that basically the right to life, so basically ending violence is the, the priority of many mediators. So I fully agree that, um, yes, this is kind of, it's easier to have a coherence of purpose around, around this than when, when we go to the positive piece, there is more complexity, there are different 
priorities um, and also there are many different understandings about these concepts that uh, we use and you have addressed that also in, in some of your articles, uh, Gerald. Um, however, I think um, we should not take it um, on, the, on the one hand, we should not take this unity of purpose for granted around end violence, especially in recent times. We have seen, again, kind of a, a trend towards prioritizing military means over um, diplomatic means, as we all know. So also there, I think it is not always um, uh, basically, you know, we should not take it uh, for granted or, or as something natural that just comes about. But maybe in the future, we even need to work more on this unity of purpose also around ending violence. And, and, um, and second, for, for, uh, for, for positive peace, um, I, I think this just means, or what, what this indicates, and this is for me the kind of novel part, is that we really need to work on this. This is basically an additional task for peace builders, not just to kind of implement their programs and look what can their programs contribute to peace, but also how can we really, and you know, this could be a, a task, of course, for the UN, how can we foster this unity of purpose amongst different actors? So to add that to our thinking about peace building, this is something really um, uh, important. And in that sense, I think, um, yes, it is, it is possible to kind of manufacture um, or, you know, to work towards this coherence. Um, I have seen many um, UN mediators, for instance, really saying that, you know, they now they don't just work with the conflict parties and, and maybe civil society and, and others, but they also work with kind of the regional actors, the international actors. So they have many different, as we would call it, scales to foster coherence and, and consistency of purpose and, and not just kind of the conflict um, or the, the small conflict nucleus um, itself. Whether it can then kind of converge from this intentional convergence to something kind of more natural, I'm not too sure. Um, I think especially in current times, um, you know, it will be, it will need more work rather than less work. And uh, so I don't think whether that's kind of just kind of an, um, a natural um, uh, development from intentional to unintentional uh, convergence. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, I think this opens up for a lot of interesting questions about, about peace and, you know, the abstract notion of peace, whether a peace system is built on a more abstract notion of peace than sort of an emplaced everyday type of peace, but also in terms of what kind of parallel pieces can exist at different scales, and can we talk about peace in plural here at different mm -hmm. scales? I think there are a lot of intriguing theoretical uh, and also empirical questions to, to continue discussing when it comes to this. Um, and, and I think there is so much need for more work on this. And, and all three of you are really advancing our theoretical thinking on, on this. Um, and I was wondering if you want to say a few final words before we wrap it up and to, to stay within the time limit of what is a nice Coco conversation. So Susanna, do you wanna say something, a concluding word or so? Uh, yeah, I can have a, have a go. I think what I really appreciate about your uh, project, Sarah, um, is a lot, um, but also that you take on the very challenging task of um, taking a theory and then trying to kind of um, don't want to say put flesh on the bones because I'm a vegetarian, put cheese on the bread um, or no, honey on the croissant. Um, and that is, I think we do that, uh, we don't do this enough. And it kind of shows us the potential limits of theorizing. And this is also how we develop theorizing. Um, and uh, so I'm kind of, I really find this transgender approach intriguing um, and I'm sure I'll look at it um, again, but I think like Annika already said, it'd be great if people were kind of using models and um, try to empirically substantiate them. Um, and then what I find is a little bit um, of a shame when it comes to your article, you know so much about the region. There wasn't enough space for all the empirical, the rich empirical data that you have. And I'm, I look out for more publications um, because I find 
like you said, there is not enough literature on, on the region. Um, you've spent a lot of time there. You spoke to many, many actors um, on various scales, obviously. Um, so I think that already is a very, very important contribution. I'm looking forward to reading other stuff on the region as well. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. I see in a book, a book in the making here, Sarah. Gerard, please. Well, I mean, I um, again, I'd like to just articulate, uh, you know, my appreciation for the for the project and 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 for Sarah's effort to put cheese on the bread, I suppose. Um, uh, and I think that, yeah, I, I would agree completely with Susanna's in, in, um, uh, kind of desire for more people to be empirically kind of testing and 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 and. Um, and that's the only way really to develop models, right? Um, and, and I think that we, we have to be doing more of that. And, and I think Sarah noted herself, you know, we are, we are now in a time where, uh, you know, maybe 20 years ago, peace building and transitional justice were kind of on the rise uh, and, and concern regarding violence and, and, and the use of violence and, uh, was, um, was high perhaps, and now it's perhaps, less or uh, we we seem to be entering a more violent uh, period i mean i guess what i would what i would what i would what i would encourage maybe is 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 that we think um you know i understand the desire i mean most of my own writing is in the local turn focusing obviously mainly on sierra leone and on and on how local people experienced uh peace interventions transitional justice etc in that context but you know, this model was an attempt to recognize that it's those global dynamics and the exactly the kind of intertwining across scales that Susanna is pointing to in her earlier comments that can derail local attempts and that 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 really kind of require us to have a broader global perspective that takes into account power and economics and interrelations across scales. Um, and um, and if we don't therefore develop these models and test these models and 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 really adjust these models over time in response to to evidence from the ground, um, we won't really have a way to respond. And I think this is this is the problem with the local turn, um, myself included. You know, for a time we were really quite focused on 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 what's possible in the local, um, and there are obviously possibilities in the local, but those possibilities can be very quickly chucked out the window if if a global power decides um, or, or, or sometimes they're never even possible because of kind of economic conditions and, and all the other things that global power has structured over the last many decades now. So I think that that's, that's all I would kind of in, encourage. I mean, I, th I, I think you're right. That it looks like to be a book in this kind of project, but in reality, I think there's many books because I think we're only at the start of this, this kind of effort to really figure out how these scales are interacting and, and figure out therefore a better way to critique the kind of power that that is structuring all of this violence i don't know how that helps probably doesn't <laughs> thank you gerard i think it inspires people to continue working on it and sarah the final word is yours thank you very much um yeah i think you know what you said before anika about the plurality of peace or pieces and I think I agree with Gerard that for a long time, the focus is very much on what peace means locally, but especially in current times, I think we also need to re-question what it means globally and internationally and, and regionally and what peacemaking and peace building means because for a long time there has been, we can call it Western consensus, but there has been sort of a consensus how you know we build peace, etc. And this has crumbled in, in recent years. So I think the interrogation now about you know what the, what the definition of peace is and how we make and build peace really has to to be transcalar and um, now more than ever. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you to to all of you for contributing to Coco Conversations. It was a pleasure moderating it, and I'm sure we will have a lot of viewers who will use this uh, as a road into looking at transcalar peace system, transcalarity, and also to the spatial turn in peace and conflict studies. So with those final words, I want to say thank you again, and um, hope to see you soon. Thank you.